Indeed, we begin. In this issue, we will explore some of the reminders that come from within. Of course, in your outer world, you are accustomed that when it is time to be reminded of a certain occasion or a certain timetable, there are those markers that come from without. Perhaps something will arrive in the mail, in the post, and you will say, ah, it is time for this again. It is well worth noting. Perhaps someone will call you on the telephone and remind you of a certain place to meet, of a promise, or an engagement. Your body also has certain reminders when it is time to eat, when it is time to sleep. And all manner of commitments have a way of letting you know that something is about to take place or that in some way you are being asked to take note. The same is true of all of the different aspects that are within you. So as you might imagine, your physical body has certain aspects, certain places within itself. Your heart is located somewhere in your body quite familiar to you. That is where it lives. It has a place to be. And you recognize that place and its functions. Similarly, the case with the other organs of the body. You can point to here or there and know what is there, what is taking place, and what purpose it serves. But now we look a little bit further, a little bit further in to the auric field. This field also is very much a part of you, very much a part of your life, your integrity, that which holds you together. So while you may believe that your beingness begins and ends in the body and with your thoughts and with awareness, there is indeed a field that surrounds you, enfolds you, nurtures you. And without this field of awareness, the integrity of your being would not be succinct. One thought would not follow the next. One day would not follow the next in the order in which you are accustomed to. So some of these places, some of these locations within your being are directed by the soul, are influenced in all ways by that which you are. So in this time, we will explore some of these places, some of of these locations, what they are able to offer you and how you might use them for a resource in your life. To begin with, there is a place within that knows. So it is a knowing place. It is a well of wisdom that is not quite wisdom yet. So it is a well that contains knowledge. Knowledge is a certain awareness that pertains to you. Knowledge is more than useful information. Knowledge is that which is supportive to you, allows you to become engaged or to grow based upon what it offers. It is a resource that you may draw upon something that you may compare, something that you can allow within you. So there is a place within you that knows. This location then contains a great deal of knowledge. It is a library of knowledge. It knows everything that you have truly learned in this life. And it knows everything that you truly wish or desire to learn about yourself, about life, or about this life. So this location pays particular attention to any kind of particles of wisdom that might drift into or through your field.
For instance, if you have a friend in a difficult situation and you are able to see everything that they undergo to free themselves or to learn about themselves or to overcome a certain moment, there is a place within you that observes this in their life and in some way stores this knowledge for yourself. Perhaps in the outer plane you would simply say, Oh, how fortunate it is that it is they and not I that are undergoing such a difficult trial in this moment. I hope that a similar fate does not befall me. But, in a larger sense, the place within you that knows and accumulates knowledge is very much paying attention to every small nuance, every small aspect, not simply to save you from a similar fate as your outer reality may indicate to you, but so that it can truly understand. So the place within you that stores knowledge also wishes to understand life, to understand the underlying principles of life to use that to further knowledge, to build a library that is resourceful to you so that you will have that to draw upon. And all of that takes place with or without your knowing. Sometimes you simply draw upon an aspect of knowledge knowing that it is so, knowing that that thought is impeccable and useful to you in that moment, perfect and pertinent, and you draw upon that. And perhaps you did not even know where it had come from, where it was stored, or how it managed to, well, magically surface just in time to be of assistance to you. So this place also then has a specific location within your field at a deeper level than you would recognize it is deeper than the surface. The next place to explore is that which yearns. That which yearns is simply more than that which wants or that which desires something or that which needs something. A yearning is something that must be lived. It is something that strives to be born something that strives to live through you, to recognize itself as alive and aliveness. So a yearning more than a desire is something that from within stimulates, moves, emerges, that which continually finds some way to rise to the surface to make itself known. A yearning is not something that pities itself, by the way. A yearning does not say, Oh, and woe that I have not accomplished that yet, or woe that all the years have gone by and still I am longing for the same thing. So while that which you yearn may feel to you in the emotional sense like a longing, it has much more purpose than that. Because that which yearns is able to enliven itself. And that is why it does not pity itself or think that it is too late for something to come forward. Perhaps you can think of places within you or subjects that you have considered and somewhat abandoned or set aside, thinking, oh, it is too late for that now. I should have explored that years ago. Now I am a little bit older, or now the moment has passed, or what it will be. That which yearns continues to live, because the soul which inspires it lives in it and through it. The soul, of course, is timeless. It does not think it is too late to do this or that. The soul continues to bring forward opportunities for discovery, for coming forward. And as long as that is the case, the yearning is still present. The yearning has no time frame associated with it, I tell you again. 
and the yearning is simply ever present. It does not become stronger or more demanding, but it does become more ardent. It simply makes its presence known to you. It lets you know, there it is. There I am. We are still with you. We are still present with you and for you. It can still be engaged. It can be drawn to you. It is sacred as the breath itself. So it is important for you to recognize this yearning as well and to identify it as separate from a want or a need. If you must liken it to something, then it is more like a desire because there is more truth in a desire, more true essence in that. And so we say to you then, there is life here and life yet to be discovered. Sometimes your dreams have nowhere else to go but to live in this yearning place. That is where they locate themselves, particularly if they have been abandoned. If someone has said, well, that was just a dream, if that was just my imagination, or that will never come to fruition, or the last time I tried it, it did not work, well, it must go somewhere. If the mind will dismiss it, and it is enlivened and alive, then even if the mind dismisses it, where would it go? Where would it go? So to this yearning place, that is where it will present itself. And that is where all the parts of you that are still becoming you, whether they are acknowledged or accepted, they are still you. There is a place within you that sees. You have trained yourself to think that you see with your eyes. Everything that is before you, everything that is outside of you, in a myriad of color, in a myriad of situations, you open your eyes each day and you see a world before you that presents itself to you. You present yourself to it, engage the day with eyes open. And so you believe that you see to the best of your ability everything that is put before you and are able to steer a course or stay the course as the case may be. But there is another place within you as well that sees. Not only does it see in ways more than the eyes do, but it also watches. So the part within you that sees, sees life a little bit different on your behalf. It sees all things a little bit more dimensionally. Or imagine that the very same day that presents itself to you in all of its circumstances and situations and appointments, imagine that this part of you that sees is able to rearrange all of these circumstances in order to see them a little bit differently. So think of it that way. If you awaken on a day and your first priority is your job or getting to work on time, attending to a family, a business decision, a worry or a care, and so you arrange yourself in that way, this part of you sees life, sees your life, your day, a little bit differently. And so it is able to rearrange what you see, allowing even the outer planes to receive into the mind's eye a little bit different perspective, perhaps a little bit different position. In this way, you might say that there has been a different ray of light added to what you already knew. Perhaps on a certain day you will say, today I was able to see that same situation from a slightly different perspective. Hmm, I never thought of it that way, you might say. I wonder where that came from and why didn't I see it sooner? That perhaps is the most often the case. Well, you did see it sooner, but sometimes what this place sees must also be combined or in some way locate the thoughts associated with what it sees in order to give to you the full impression.
You see, what is seen is then impressed upon you so that you are able to understand it. So you are able then to combine that with the knowledge place and to have a newer or a deeper understanding of what you see. Sometimes that happens almost immediately, but sometimes it does not. Sometimes it must wait until there are one or two or three or more experiences linked so that what is seen can then be truly reordered without gaps, without missing pieces or places so that a complete picture, somewhat rearranged, can then be offered to you. When there is less than enough of this picture to be offered, well, some part of you may feel a little bit different, a little bit sketchy about a certain situation, thinking that there might be a different way to see it, but you can't quite figure it out. And so you go about continuing to do what you do, unable to figure it out or to reorganize it until the seeing place does this for you. The watching aspect of this, the other side of the same coin, observes what you are thinking, what you are doing with what you are thinking, how you are arranging or linking your thoughts, in what ways you order them, and even what ways you pay attention to more than others. The watching place is aware of whether you pay more or less attention in the morning or the afternoon, during one activity or another, in the presence of a friend or a stranger, while you are traveling alone or during moments of sleep. It watches and observes how all of the different processes are linked together and it devises ways to be of service to you. So it watches how the day is organized, how the mind organizes the thoughts, how the being prioritizes the day, and it will make then the movements to show the visual pictures. Many times you will think that your eyes have deceived you, or that you see something in a different light or in a different color. I never saw it that way. It changed. I could have sworn that last time I looked in that same area, it wasn't there. This place within you that sees and watches also is capable of finding those lost or misplaced objects, lost or misplaced thoughts or communications that have gone unsaid, unspoken, unclarified, or let aside to one day figure themselves out. Perhaps you can think about certain subjects or situations that you cannot quite figure out until finally the mind says, well, enough. I will simply have to set this aside for now. I cannot arrive at a thought or an idea of what or how to do. So aside it goes. Well, the seeing, watching place still prepares for you understanding that with a change of perception and what is seen, all things can yet be reorganized. There is a place within you that loves. Perhaps it is a bit too simple to put it this way, to offer it to you in these terms. There is a place within you that is always, always in love. It is in love with you. It is in love with life. It is in love with how you do things and how you see things and how you offer things to yourself. This place is often overlooked, particularly because on the outer planes, most of the time you are saying to yourself how not loving the world is or how not loving you are of yourself, aspects of yourself, your personality self, the aspects of yourself that you have not tamed yet, that you have not managed yet, that you have not understood yet. And so these fall under criticism. And the more that you criticize them, the less that you are able to love these aspects of yourself, seeing them as faults, 
comparing them to those of others and, for the most part, finding them lacking. However, there is a place within you that loves, that is always loving, that is always in love with you, with what you are, with how you are always in a state of discovery, with how you are always wondering about the next moment, even if it is how to fix the next moment. You see, it is because you truly have a love of life that you grow from love. There is a place within you that always, always comes from love and goes to love. And all of the variety and differences of expression that are love and loving. There is a place within you then that sees life as an expression of love. It sees love as a community, a communal event between species that are coming to know each other and love each other. It sees life as a love between earth and heaven, as a community of different species, all arranged within themselves and each other in a loving capacity. It understands that all things are woven together by a certain thread of compassion, even if there seems to be little else. So in spite of your outer planes seeing that there is war here, suffering there, struggle there, and misunderstanding somewhere else, this part of you loves and knows that one way and one day in a deeper and fuller understanding of life that this loving place will reveal itself to and for all beings without exception. Now, not only does it have this outlook from within, but primarily the function of this location within your field is truly to love you, not just to love life, not just to have compassion for those that make their way in the world. No, the love comes for the self, for self-understanding, for self-discovery, for the movement from within to without. It is in love with that. It is in love with the thought that you carry during the day. It is in love with the activities that you are able to accomplish or to do for yourself or for others. This part of you is incapable of thinking that perhaps you did not do something well or right or long enough or good enough or like that. It is not that it loves you so it looks in another direction. It looks very much in all of the directions of your life. And it sees only love of the soul for the self, of the self for the personality, of the personality for what it knows and does not know, of the reverence for life, the reflection within. It is pure love, pure, deep, concentrated droplets of love. And this location is able to move about your field. So while some of the locations that we are describing literally have a place in your field, almost like a map that you could pinpoint and say, oh yes, there it is. This love location is a little bit more free flowing. So it circulates about the outer aspects of the field and then, like an echo, also returns from the center to the outer, from the inner to the outer, deepening the process, weaving each day a perfect tapestry. If it finds little holes in itself, and, based upon human awareness, it always does, it finds a way to move into these areas, to flow into these areas, to cover them with the frequency of love, to fill the gaps 
It sews them together, it weaves them back together until they become whole and loving and the frequency is restored so that in one way or another your day, your being is full of love. Now the question may arise, if that is the case, why don't I feel that? Why don't I feel in love with myself? Why is it so much easier for me to love others more than myself? Well, indeed, because that, like the husk of a seed, is the outer layer. It is the harder layer, a little bit more crusty, a little bit more affected by life, a little bit more like the bark of a tree, if you like, protecting the softer aspects within from the more harsh aspects of nature and the environment. And so there is a part of you that fears to be vulnerable, fears to be pure love in a world that does not yet recognize itself as that. And so it has grown even more overprotective. Even more there is an outer skin that layers and protects you from harm. Most of the time I will tell you that harm is self-inflicted. While you are protecting yourself from the opinions of others or the potential harm from others or judgment from others, you have become over accustomed to judging yourself, having harsh and differentiated opinions of yourself. So the softer loving qualities, although they circulate about you, nurturing, comforting, bringing presence and weaving all of this together, most of the time they still remain unconscious to you. Now that is not a bad thing altogether, because although they are perhaps unconscious to you, they are pure. They have not been altered. They have never been lessened. Their quality remains at an all-time high, without exception. And so in all of these ways, sweet ones, you are love, you are made of love, you pour and circulate love from one aspect of yourself to another, you direct it within and without. It is accessible to you in all ways, in all times. There is never a lesser quality or a lesser amount. And first and foremost, you are in love with yourself and then you are in love with others and then with life and then with the idea of life. And it will always be this. So it is well to know it now. There is a place within you that yields. To yield is not the same as to give in or to give way. You do not cave in even if you allow another to know what direction they will take or to know their way or to choose their way. There is a part of you that yields to something at times that is more wise, something that at times is more pertinent or more knowledgeable. Something that in some way says this way first and your way next. So to yield, whether it is to a thought or to an agreement with another, to yield is simply to say, we will explore this way first and the next way next. It does not say, I got my way last time, so this time you can have your way. It simply is a path to explore. So imagine that there are many different paths within you related to each individual thought or decision that you might consider. That yielding is simply the choosing of one path over another. As you choose one decision or one path, another is not chosen. Another is less so that another can be more. 
To yield is to say I will examine again on another day. To yield is to say the choice is always mine, so I have already made it in this favor. To yield is to say this way appears to be simpler. To yield is to say I will circle about this decision and surely I will come back to the other as well. To yield is to move to one aspect of polarity before the other. It does not mean to backslide. It does not mean to surrender. It means to choose. To actively choose for the self, for the betterment of the self, for the betterment of the decision. It does not omit other decisions or choices. It does not say, once I have chosen this way, all of the others are forever closed to me, so I had better get it right. And so to yield is just that, a movement in a simple way, with cause and for the benefit of effect. When you yield, there is less struggle. Less struggle for the mind, less struggle for the body, less debate within the hemispheres of the self, less for the two polarities within you to battle, more for you to confide to yourself. In essence, when you yield to a certain choice or direction, you reveal to yourself more choices, not less because now the mind or the path has become softer. It is pliable. You did not choose the least of all evils or the only choice that you could have made. To yield is simply to move gently in the direction that has the least effort and the most reward, knowing that the next yielding will bring a new set of choices. So it is important to know this aspect of you. This one, I tell you, is just as important as the rest and certainly worth giving it its due. There is a place within you that stands for less of another word. It stands up for itself. It stands up for you. Know that there is a place within you that, like a silent sentinel, is always standing up for you. Imagine that. Imagine that there is a place within you that so knows you, so trusts you, is so certain of your righteousness in the world, of your worth and your right to be, what you are and how you are that it is always standing up for you. To say that it is standing up in a way implies that it is standing God for you as well. But this must be seen as a very gentle, very protective, very nurturing standing. It is not something that will hold the world an arm's length away from you. It does not create a barrier or a boundary between you and something or someone else. It protects you by being naturally what it is and how it is. It is a natural aspect of you that is so, so certain of you that it is always present, always next to you, always standing. So it is appropriate to say that it stands for what you believe. That is not to say that it stands for all of your belief system, particularly those that you may have outgrown. It stands for those true aspects that you believe in about life. For instance, if you believe at the very depth and heart of things that life is good, in its first and final expression, then this part of you stands for that. If you believe that all beings in some way 
serve the whole and the wholeness and each other, then this aspect stands for this. So the better way to put this is that this aspect stands for your truths, for your higher truths. It never allows them to fall beneath a certain banner or frequency. That which is true is always true. That which is loyal is always loyal. It does not falter. It does not doubt. It does not lack. It cannot be let down. Even if you were to show this aspect of you, your worst shadow side or shadow self, it would stand tall and mighty for you, before you, and because of you, because it understands at the deepest levels that you are neither a shadow thought nor a shadow self. So it holds a thought at the highest and greatest it aligns and alights itself with you. It stands for all that you learn, all that you share. It will never think or see less of you. So, like a sentinel, day and night, there it is, standing true, standing tall, standing proud, whether or not you are proud or in pride of yourself. Even those humble places within you that would not allow you to acknowledge pride at that level. Well, there is a self, a place within you that does and does so well. There is a place within you that is impartial and immovable. Well, that is an interesting one to consider. It is hard for you to think of something so solid as something that might be immovable. After all, all things budge, all things grow and remake themselves and dissolve themselves and begin the process again. What is it that can be so immovable? Well, it is exactly that. It is that which is so impartial, so neutral and so balanced that it is, in essence, immovable. So just as there are mutable, changeable signs, there are also those things that are fixed. And as far as your being is concerned, this place within you is a fixed place. It is somewhat near the center of your being, but not exactly. If you can imagine where it is that your lower sense of gravity is located, that is where you will find this immovable place. Now, what is immovable about it is exactly that it is neutral. It cannot be moved to the left or the right. You could not convince it that something is right and something else is wrong. You could not convince it that light is better than shadow or shadow is better than light. You could not convince it of anything. You cannot sway it. You cannot alter it. You cannot in any way move it or shape it into something else. This part of you is neutral, balanced and perfect. This is the part of you that has tuned itself to you to your frequency and it is set at that immovable place so that you will always have a center to come back to and that is the benefit of this place no matter where you go you will come back to your center no matter where you began your journey you will find this place again even if you think you have become lost this immovable, perfect and centered place, neutral and balanced, is where you will recover yourself, your thoughts. It is your next beginning. If you think that you have failed at this or that or life, you will return to here, recover yourself from all else that is added to you, and begin again from the neutral, balanced place.
On the outer planes, it will seem to you that you begin the next leg of the journey from where you left off. Well, I came that far. Now I will go further. But that is not necessarily the case. You always return to the beginning place. The beginning place is the centered place. It is neutral, balanced, aware of everything that you have learned and everything that you have done. So every beginning comes from here. Perhaps you would say to yourself, well, next time I do that, I'll go here and not there. Or I would never do it this way. It would for certain be done elsewhere because now I have learned from my mistakes. Indeed, you have. And because you have learned from what you perceive as a mistake or a misgesture, that is perceivingly, exactingly why you would begin the next step from the centered place, from the neutral place. If you had only truly not mastered something, or truly led only with the left or with the right, then you would continue along a path, but it would not be the next new thought, the next new true direction. So to have an immovable place within yourself, and we must be clear, this is not a stubborn place. The fact that it is immovable does not mean that it is stubborn or incapable or unwilling. It is immovable because it is just. Imagine scales that are perfectly balanced. There is no need for them to be adjusted in one direction or another, to be more made, more weighty or dense or even lightened. There is a place that is always in balance, always just, always even, always centered. And this is where you return to again and again for every new thought, for every new beginning, for every new truth, for every new chapter in life. A very fine beginning then. There is a place within you that studies that is always studying and always learning. Here you have the true student of life. So even when you believe that you have gone down the road, oh, the same time, I have learned all about that person, thank you very much. I know all about that situation or that subject. All I wish to know, all I care to know, thank you. There is a place within you that is still hungry. Not simply hungry for more information, it is hungry to study. To see something from a different angle, from a different perspective. To see a new ray of light or a new ray of hope. To study something. To study something means to hope, to understand it. It does not mean simply to learn or to gain or extract all of its information. So to study is the seeking of a deeper understanding. So there is a place within you that regardless of what it knows or how much knowledge it has accumulated regarding any one person or place or thing or life, it is studying again a new, newing and deepening. Sometimes this is at work in an older generation. Perhaps you will see those that now in review of their life for those that perhaps begin to live their life, but in hindsight, now they begin to have become true students of life. So here is the aspect of you, the very deeper aspect of you, that is the true student of life. Understanding the meaning of an action, an opportunity or a missed opportunity. The effects of words spoken or unspoken, a moment that was taken advantage of, or a person that was left at a disadvantage. So this aspect, whether or not you are aware of it, consciously aware of it, there is a part of you that is studying life, being a perfect student of life, drinking as it would be, taking in every sight and sound and nuance, seeing its own effect of life, 
practicing how to cause or cause something to be different or have a different effect. So here in a moment perhaps you have observed others that you have known for a very, very long time. And then somehow they begin to speak differently or sound differently to offer a different truth or a belief. And you begin to say, hmm, perhaps they have truly changed after all these years. Perhaps they have finally learned something or remembered something. I had just about given up on that. Well, you see, there is a part of each being that is always studying the moment, how to improve on a moment or a thought. You improve on a moment or a thought by breathing more life into it. The more life that something has, the more versatile it becomes, the more creative it becomes, the more purposeful. So those places within you that are true students of life have now become more enlivened in the process. So at any age, at any time or place, a being that has studied and learned has an emergent cycle. An emergent cycle is when that which has become potent in life begins a new cycle of cause and effect. At times on the outer plane it may seem that it is a reversal a reversal of thought or experience, a reversal of fortune or what it will be. It is not simply someone else attempting to make amends. That is what it may appear to be on the outer plane. However, as a student of life, when the newer truth emerges, it is the student that is then able to seize the new knowledge, to couple it with love that has more than likely circulated into this study place. And life then becomes renewed in the process. You see? So all of these different aspects that we have been looking into are always on call, always in the process of enlivening you. So whether you believe that you are in an outward or inward cycle, of movement outward in life or retreating to the inner core. All of these aspects and locations are at work on your behalf. They are you. They are aspects of you that many times you are little aware of, but these are directed by the soul. They do not tire of you or your situations or subjects, even those that are lifelong or what you would consider karmic lives long. Infused and directed by the soul, they continue to direct themselves inward and outward in your favor, monitoring your progress, weaving themselves together, and in all ways making your life a fuller extension even beyond anything that you might imagine that you are. There is a place within you that guides. It simply guides. It does not insist. It does not tap you on the shoulder and say, go this way, go this way, because you have already gone that way so many times. Can we not avoid it just this once? No. The place within you that guides simply does that. It creates a suggestion in such a way that is impartial. It guides by allowing you to see even the same thing in a different light, even the same thought in a different way, even that which you have lived again and again and again. It will offer itself to you once more as if it were being served to you for the first time. If there is purpose in the guidance, if there is purpose in the movement of expression, that guiding aspect of you will continue to point in the same direction. Some part of you may become irritated at this 
it will say, is there no other way for me? Is there no other choice for me? Some part of you may feel trapped. Some part of you may feel certain that you have been guided the wrong way, that it is a different direction that you seek and that no one yet has been brilliant enough to show you where the light is truly shining. But the aspect of you that guides knows a direction that you do not. It sees not only the horizon that is before you, but the one after that and the one beyond that as well. It sees beyond the seven hills much further than you can see, and so the guidance that it offers takes into account what you see and what you cannot see, what you know and what you cannot know. So guidance comes in a variety of different ways, an impetus from within, an impulse from without, and yes, at times even a tap on the shoulder, look to the left and not to the right, look here and not there, or what it will be. In essence, it does not truly matter whether you believe in this guiding aspect of you or not. Once again, all of these different aspects and places and locations that we have been speaking of are directed and infused with energy by the soul. The soul being eternal in nature, infinite in patience, and completely trusting in the decisions that it has made for this life, is in no hurry to have you get something or go somewhere. It is completely content to allow things to be as they are, to allow the moment to be guided from within, and that all of the effects would come. So this is not something that you need concern yourself with, whether you must take the guidance or not, whether you are listening or not listening, paying attention or have missed it. It is always at work. Think of it then as a guiding light, as a lighthouse, always shining its beacon, always looking out for you, always offering itself the way that it does, independently of your thoughts, of your actions, of past, present or future preferences, opinions or judgments. It will guide in the highest, best and deepest ways. There is a place within you that creates and is creative. Even if you cannot think of another way, there is another way, it says to you. I have already tried that, you say. There is another way, the creative place within you says. There is another direction. There is another substance. There is another thought. There is another day. There is another combination. There is another truth. The creative place within you tirelessly will bring forward to you other thoughts that say it can yet be done, it can be accomplished. Look this and look that. Without this place, without the certainty of this place, more than once, many a time in life, he would say, I have failed or it has failed, or I will not do it again. With this in place, some part of you will say, All right, once more. All right, I know there must be a way into this or through this. It is because creativity exists at the outer levels that it also exists at the deeper levels. It is because the creative genius of the universe is always at work that the creative genius within you does the same. So there is always the next idea, the next bounty, the next desire, the next anything, even the next breath comes from a place within you that is pure creativity. It creates it gives birth to the next moment. It gives birth to the next thought or the next idea. Without exception and tirelessly, even when the outer planes are tired, it will say, 
one more time. And then after that, once more again. It is tireless not because it is incapable of becoming tired. It is tireless because of what it is. Pure creativity does not know failure. It does not know less or more. The in-breath knows and recognizes the out-breath. The out-breath lives for the in-breath. The in-breath lives and loves the out-breath. Neither one could live by holding the breath. Both know this. Therefore, there is only the next creative breath. So the creative principle is what upholds this place within you. It nurtures all things, restores all things. It is why there is a next day. It is why there is a next attempt. It is why there is faith or hope or any other next. It is ever, ever present. There is a place within you that hopes. It simply hopes. It is a place that is open. Hope always holds the door open. Hope does not open and close a door hoping that it can somehow stick a foot in the door or keep it open. It simply allows the door to remain open knowing that at any time, at any point, something unexpected, necessary, desirable, creative will come through that door. It does not simply look longingly out the door, hoping in that dreary way that one day something interesting may come. No, not like that. Hope, ever present, always keeping the threshold clean, making the welcome mat ready, always in expectation. Something is coming. I hope it does. I know it does. So hope is more closely linked with knowing. One does not hope with emptiness. A hope is filled. A hope is filled with desire. A hope is filled with, well, the creativity that we have just spoken of. So hope maintains itself. It reorganizes itself based upon the creative principle. So it hopes for this and hopes for that. And then, in the meantime, while it is doing that, it does not simply allow the hope to become dusty on the shelf. No, it improves upon that. Well, now that I have hoped for this, I can also hope for that. And now I can remake that hope until it will look like something different. So hope is molding and shaping life and the next moment even if it has not arrived yet. Hope is the welcome mat. It is the open door. It is the part of you that expects and likes to expect. It likes to hope for the next. It hopes for the next opportunity and the next choice. If you have blue, green today, it hopes for blue tomorrow and vice versa. It hopes for the new. It welcomes it, nurtures it invites it in. So there is a place within you that will always hope and never tire of hoping. It hopes for things to be different. And why? Because it also knows that things can be different. So hope is not hopeless. You see? Hope, when and if it could ever become in danger of hopelessness, retreats to the place that, in essence, is immovable and impartial. And so hope draws upon that, restores itself, and once again, hopes for the best, hopes for the most perfect, hopes for that which knows and discovers. Hopes is that which hopes for all that one could want or desire and then expects it too. There are some that perhaps on the outer planes will say, well, that is somewhat useless. Why hope for something 
that has not happened? Why hope for something that one hundred times already has not manifest itself? But you see, hope is not based on expectations, but upon expecting something to be received. It is knowing that in giving there is receiving, and in receiving there is giving and the next cycle. So hope is that which is ever present and recognizes itself as that. It is innocent, it is joyous, it is pure, and it directs humanity. It is hope that allows you to draw the next breath. It is hope that says I will have a next life, or in my next life I will do this or be this or in my next job, or in my next assignment, in my next relationship, in my next friendship, in my next project. It is hope that says, the next and the next, I will do it differently, or similarly, or like that. We come now to the last of the beautiful and perfect locations of the fields. There is a place that grows. It grows always. It rests, and while it is resting, it grows. It grows, and while it is growing, it rests and knows that it will grow again and more. It grows stronger. It grows more beautiful. It grows more bountiful and more flexible. It grows from within and without it grows based upon what it sees, what it knows, how it receives what it knows. It grows because it wishes to. And so here the soul becomes more and more interested in its own growth. It is a developmental growth, at times incremental and bit by bit, at times different, introspective. It is a growth that is not monitored but continues to become stronger and stronger until the growth can be felt even in the beat of the heart, even in the breath of the moment. It is a growth that allows one to see further. It is a growth that deepens compassion for life itself. It is a growth that entrusts oneself to the deeper layers of being and knows that something that emerges becomes even more beautiful. It is a kind of growth that allows you to feel as if your feet have just left the ground. Somehow you are walking just a little bit above the ground. It is a growth that allows the soul to soar to the angels and back again. It is a growth that is more attributable to heaven than to earth though you would recognize it upon the earth as well. It is a growth that allows you to look back and see how far you have come. It is a growth that allows you to know that you can assist others in their own growth as well. So it is a growth that draws upon the experience, physical experience, non-physical, all that you have accomplished, all that you have learned about yourself and about life. Exponential and exciting, it is a growth that goes beyond expectations. It is not a measured growth that you would appeal to yourself on the outer planes compare, compare to others. It is a growth that matters but only to the soul, and the soul makes no comparison of itself to others. The soul does not say, Oh, look, my being has grown further than yours and in a shorter amount of years upon earth. Oh, no, sweet one, these very human measures do not fall into this category. It is a growth that is bounty. It is a growth that offers the fruit and the seed again for the next season, all at once. It allows one to sow the seeds of life, to harvest them at once, and to make certain that there is enough to provide for all. 
it is true growth. Perhaps you would call this spiritual growth if we were to give it a name that would be to your likening or would allow the mind to access it. How does one compare spiritual growth? See, it matters not how many of the holy writs or books of good value that you have studied or incorporated in you to your well-being. Yes, certainly incorporates the principles, the tenets of life. But it is a growth that the soul receives and nurtures itself. It is a purposeful, lucrative growth. On the skin it looks like a fine polish. It makes the eyes shine brightly as if more light now pours through them. If you like, it is a humanitarian growth for it allows one to see the perspectives of more than one and all at once. So there is a place within you that is growth and growing always and without exception looking to the light of the day the light from within it nurtures itself from all things even from what you would consider your shadow even that it uses as the true nutrients of the earth by which the roots will draw upon and reach even higher that which you would consider your darkness or your shadow it uses to strengthen its roots its stems, its core. So here we have explored but twelve of the strands, if you like, locations, each forming a perfect cord within you, each braided perfectly and woven into the very tapestry of your life and your being, your form and formlessness in the field of energy that you are reflects this. No two are alike. None could be more perfect than the next. Each of its own pattern of perfection. Here I offer to you then very gentle reminders of these from within. We have explored then a glimpse of the aspects from within for you to draw upon. You do not need to wait until moments of weakness of the will to remember these to remind yourself that this is what you are made of but indeed even when moments of light and brightness use this as a fine polish and know that even luster becomes brighter day by day in celebration of life then sweet ones I take my leave and bid you good day